Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us again for another live stream uh, series in our webinars to help answer questions about the impact of COVID-19, the pandemic, and what it's doing to our mountain communities. My name is David Krause. I'm the editor of the Aspen Times, and I'm the lead of the editor group for Swift Communications, which has publications in Colorado, Utah, and California. We'll be hosting this live stream for about the next 45 minutes, and we are pleased to be joined today by Dr. Glenn Mays, who is a professor and chair at the Colorado School of Public Health. Some of you might remember Dr. Mays was with us for our first live stream back on March 19th as the outbreak started to spread across our region very quickly. In today's session with Dr. Mays, we thought we would check in with him and see if he can give us some updates and address questions about testing, vaccines, continued social distancing measures, and what communities might expect in the coming weeks and months as they slowly get back to business. We've been collecting questions from our readers for the speaker, and we invite you to send your questions on this feed, and we'll get to as many of those in the last part of our webinar as we can. Uh, if you are joining us via Zoom, I ask that you do hit your mute button, and if you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A section. Uh, real quick, I'd like to introduce all of the editors and the communities that we serve. Uh, here in Colorado, we have Eli Pace at the Sky High News, which serves Grand County, Nate Peterson at the Vail Daily, Nicole Miller at the Summit Daily News, Peter Bowman at the Glenwood Springs Post Independent, Lisa Schlichtman is at the Steamboat Pilot in Today, Kyle Mills is at the Rifle Citizen Telegram, and Josh Carney is at the Craig Press. Over in Utah, our editor there is Bubba Brown at the Park Record in Park City. And in California, we have editors Bill Rozak at the Tahoe Tribune and Brian Hamilton at the Sierra Sun and Grass Valley Union. And then working out toward the Great Plains, we have a few agricultural publications. Uh, Rona Johnson leads up the Fence Post and editors Carrie Statham and Mariah Tibbetts at the Tri-State Livestock News and Farmer Rancher Exchange. I always like saying that one, that's a good one. So our viewers know after this live stream, we will post this Q&A to all the websites that we serve and our social media Facebook pages as well. You can also see the other live streams we've done in the past. And with that, I will turn over the conversation to Kelly Geary Agnew, who is the marketing strategist for Swift Communications and has been working with our editors on the project. And she'll do a Q&A for about the next 30 minutes with Dr. Mays, and then we'll take some reader questions. Thank you, Kelly. Great, thanks, Dave. Thanks everybody for being here with us today. Um, I'm gonna real quick let Glenn take just a second to introduce himself and talk about his experience. Great. Thank you for the chance to be with you uh, today. Um, uh, pleasure to, to talk through these issues with you. Um, I, um, I'm a professor and chair um, at the uh, University of Colorado, the Colorado School of Public Health. Um, and uh, I've spent about 20 years in the field of health services, health services research, health policy research, studying health systems and um, how, to, how to improve their, their operation and their, their impact on, on health. And, a big, big focus in, within that work is in studying preparedness for uh, large-scale hazardous events, uh, disease outbreaks, and other events that can affect health status for large groups of people, and we're in the midst of one right now. Great. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks for being here today. So, like Dave said, we've prepared some questions. Um, please put your follow-up questions in the chat box as we pr proceed. So like we've talked about, we're kind of getting to maybe some kind of reopening. We're thinking about what it might look like to return to some version of normal, although not completely normal. So as we start that reopening process across these communities that we serve, what are things that people should be thinking about? What are kind of considerations um, people are getting out more maybe than they have been in the last two months? And maybe what are some concerns as well on the public health side of things? Absolutely. Um, so these are, uh, this is a uh, very important time as we start to relax some of the strongest social distancing measures. Um, the key thing, the key, key issue for us 
is um, to, to, uh, to be able to open up parts of economy, parts of our economy and parts of our society while still uh, being able to um, slow the risk of disease transmission in our communities because uh, the fact of the matter is most of us still have not been exposed to this disease. Most of us do, do not have any immunity, a vast majority of our populations. And so um, as we start to open up, um, be able to, to um, go back to work in some cases, uh, be able to, to uh, visit businesses and um, move more around the community, very important to try to maintain social distancing while doing those activities, uh, including you know, maintaining the six foot barrier where we can, if you're in the grocery store or in businesses. Um, a second thing, wearing a mask um, or some other type of face barrier while uh, you're out in the community. Um, those, those kind of strategies would be very important as we return, more of us return to work, uh, return to, to businesses and return to, to social engagement. Just going off that real quick, is there an estimate of how pe how many per what percentage of people have been exposed? Do people think like what's that kind of still potential for more exposure? Yeah, we're starting to get some rough estimates of of prevalence of exposure in parts of the U.S. Uh, very noisy measures. Still a lot of a lot of debate about how how good our our um, estimates are on that. Um, for Colorado, where I am. Uh, our best estimates were probably one to three percent of the state population has been exposed at this stage. Um, even if we're off by an order of magnitude on that estimate, we could be, it still means the vast majority of us have not been exposed and are still vulnerable. Sure, makes sense. So we talked about this last time you were on, but once again, now that we're getting out and about more and more chance for exposure and coming into contact with the virus, what do we need to keep in mind for kind of minimizing bringing that, that back home after we've been out in public? Yeah, very, very important. Still the basics, the basic strategies we've been talking about from the beginning of this pandemic are the, are the most powerful. Um, hand washing. That's the most likely way of bringing this virus back into your home. Um, being very vigilant on hand, hand washing as soon as you get back in, into to your house. Um, there's also a, you know, a lower probability of bringing the virus in through clothing, shoes, coats, uh, that, that kind of thing. Um, and so um, uh, good, it's a good practice as well to kind of change out uh, clothing and those kind of things where, where you can. But far and away, hand washing is the most important thing that we can do on this front. Sure, makes sense. And I think it might be easy for people to feel like loosening that up or, you know, feeling like getting more comfortable. And we, we don't want people to forget about those initial guidelines for hand washing and keeping things clean. Absolutely. So masks, you mentioned that it's important to wear masks. Um, it seems like there's a lot of debate ab about masks and how effective they are and what type of mask you should be wearing. So what are some basic guidelines for what type of mask and maybe different levels of effectiveness or protection that you get from, from different options that you might use? Yeah, this, this is an area of, um, of concern and some, you know, some confusion. Uh, the, our best recommendation, the recommendation from our from the CDC, our Federal Public Health Agency, based on the best science we have now, um, is that for uh, those of us who are not healthcare personnel working in healthcare settings, uh, is that wearing some type of face covering, a mask, a bandana, uh, is recommended, and primarily that's because it's effective in reducing the likelihood that we. Uh, the mask wearers could transmit the virus to others while we're out in, in public. Um, that, that kind of face covering prevents or at least limits the amount of um, the potential for droplets to come out of your mouth and expose other, other folks, in particular while you're talking. Um, you don't re realize that, but as human beings, when we talk, we generate those droplets even if you can't see them. Um, and so the mouth covering, um, uh, that's the that's the main reason for that recommendation. It prevents that that uh, exposure. Right? It's not really going to protect you as the wearer from getting someone else's get, being exposed from somebody else, but it's going to prevent protect you from causing harm to other people that you might be talking with and uh, interacting with. Um, 
and you, do, you don't need to have an N95 mask uh, to do that. Any face covering will help to prevent those large droplets from trans being transmitted. We're still in an era of having shortages of personal protective equipment for our healthcare workers. And so for that reason, it's not recommended that those of us in the general public uh, try to secure the N95 masks, which are, which are the um, masks that actually uh, can uh, filter out small particles, including the viral particles that are transmitted. So we are still trying to preserve N95 masks and other personal protective equipment for our healthcare workers. Um, uh, and so that's why we're still, and we're still in a state of shortage in most parts of the U.S. for those kind of equipment. So it's not recommended to try to find an N95 mask. Just any kind of face covering will work uh, for, um, you know, for uh, complying with the recommendation around around face covering at this at this stage. And is it important that that covers your nose too, in addition to your mouth? Is that the guideline? Ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah. A covering that, that covers both nose, nose and mouth. That's going to be maximally effective in preventing uh, you from exposing others. Because again, remember, most of us who get this virus, most of us are asymptomatic. We don't know. Ellie, does it look like we lost Dr. Mays? It looks like we're still connected on the meeting. I can still hear you. Can you hear me? There we go. Oh, we can hear you, Dr. Okay. I must have had a low, an episode of low internet. <laughs> I, think the, I think the internet's getting uh, pretty over, overloaded. <laughs> All right, moving on. So antibody tests, this is a, a topic that we're hearing a lot about. Um, some of our mountain communities invested in antibody testing only to find out that they are um, not approved by the FDA for distribution and there's questions about their effectiveness. Um, can you help us understand a little bit more about antibody tests and kind of what that projection looks like? Yes, so we are, we are still at early days with uh, understanding of um, antibody tests and which, which tests are going to be most effective. Um, uh, the FDA has allowed, you know, under emergency authorization, allowed a lot of these tests into the market now. Um, for many of them, we don't have good information about how accurate they are. And so that's, that's the major problem. We've got, um, there are a growing number of research studies underway right now to evaluate accuracy and to, use, to test how we can use these te these antibody tests to understand disease prevalence, um, and that's that's probably the best place to, to make use of them now is in research studies. Um, they're uh, given the variability and given the unknowns about these tests, um, it's it's not recommended that that we try to use them for um, you know for uh, medical purposes at this at this stage or or, um, or other reasons. Hopefully. Um, in the coming weeks, we will learn more about which tests are um, more accurate, which tests can be useful, uh, and then begin to think about scaling them up and, and using them more, more widely. At this stage, um, uh, I would, um, you know, I think the recommendation is to not uh, invest a lot of, of energy um, in antibody testing uh, for, for the general public. Is there a guideline for like what percentage of accuracy would be targeted maybe by that testing to where at what point would we be able to say, yes, now it's reliable enough? Yeah, it's, it's hard to have a single answer to that because partly uh, um, the answer depends on the prevalence of the disease in our population. Right now, again, we talked about earlier, you know, we think in most, you know, most communities around the U.S., we still have a very low prevalence of this coronavirus. That means that tests, um, antibody tests that have um, even relatively small levels of 
um, error, you know, false positive or false negatives, they're still going to, they're going to be very unreliable when we apply them in a community that has relatively low levels of the, of the virus. Um, and so that's, that's the real problematic aspect is we, um, we get to a stage where this vi virus is more prevalent, then these tests can, can be more useful. Or if we find a test that's much more accurate, that is 99% accurate, you know, for example, then that, that test could be useful even in communities with relatively low prevalence of the disease. So it's, it really is kind of a complicated calculus that goes into what kind of test, uh, antibody test might, might be effective. Sure, makes sense. A lot of different factors play into it. So earlier this week, the CDC announced that there are some new symptoms maybe for people to be aware of, and maybe people are think, looking back you know, on a few months ago and realizing that they had some symptoms that maybe they didn't recognize before as potentially being coronavirus. Um, does the understanding of more symptoms or the broadening of symptoms help us to un track the virus and kind of better understand it? And maybe we can see more people who had exposure or had it without realizing it and just thinking they had the standard influenza? Uh, it, it does, absolutely. Having this larger li list of symptoms definitely helps us with identifying, uh, identifying cases and getting a better handle on the virus and, and its spread. In particular, because we're still, for the most part, only testing and prioritizing testing for, for people with symptoms. Um, and so that means recognizing that there is a broader array of symptoms means that we can be better in targeting the testing to those symptomatic uh, people. Um, and that drives our understanding of, of, of the disease. Um, those, those symptoms are all, uh, expanded symptom list are also, um, it's also very important in clinical settings and helping medical professionals, you know, again, make decisions about diagnosis and, um, and possible you know, courses of, of treatment. So, uh, so the, um, the expanded list of symptoms really are important from a public health standpoint in understanding and tracking the spread as well as from a, you know, a medical care standpoint. Sure, makes sense. So this is another thing that everybody's talking about in addition to antibody testing is what is gonna happen with a vaccine. What kind of is the process for establishing a vaccine and what's the timeline? People have said, 18 months, people have said they hope that it can happen within a year, which sounds like it might be a stretch. So what are things that are going into the process of creating that vaccine and how long might we be waiting for it to be available? Yeah, so this is something, you know, to keep our eye on. This is uh, the, the prospect of having an effective vaccine, very, very important for the long-term, you know, ultimate resolution of this, uh, this pandemic. Um, the vaccine development process is, is quite involved and it's a rigorous multi-stage research process. Uh, still, you know, I think our best, at, best case scenarios are we're looking, still looking at 12 to 18 months. Uh, best case scenario for when we might have a vaccine ready to be distributed on a wide scale, um, wide scale basis. The good news is there are, there are multiple different research efforts underway around developing uh, vaccines um, using various models. Um, and so those are occurring in parallel, um, but uh, each of those studies are still gonna have to go through this multi-stage process of testing um, in the lab, testing in animals. We now have several vaccines that are proceeded to testing in humans, but that's still a long process of testing and, and monitoring before we can draw conclusions about safety and effectiveness and then scale up production. So um, it is for sure still more than a year before we'll have a, um, a vaccine. It could be longer depending on whether some of these, some of these first vaccines, um, you know, are, um, are failures and that's a possibility. Uh, but um, the fact that we've got multiple options being tested in parallel um, is certainly a, a good situation to be in. It's not a, not a near term, term solution. Sure. How long does it typically take to develop a vaccine under normal conditions? What would be the typical timeline for another disease? Yeah, multiple years, multiple okay. years, um, three, four, six uh, years. Um, and 
Um, that's why we're very fortunate to be in the situation we are now with having multiple research teams, multiple developers testing different vaccines uh, options at the same time in that we're, we're definitely accelerating the process. Uh, we're breaking records in terms of how quickly these studies have gotten to the stages that they are now. We already have some vaccines being tested in humans right now. That's remarkable given um, that we just discovered this pathogen a few months ago, but, um, but it's still, still a ways off. Is there cause for concern with that accelerated process at all? Is it the, the chance that something will come to market that's not effective or is the process so rigorous that that wouldn't happen? Our U.S. Uh, regulatory system for vaccine development is exceptionally rigorous uh, and there's no short, shortcutting those processes. And so there's really, there's, there's not, not a risk of, um, uh, of uh, you know, of harm associated with the vaccine development process. We're not shortcutting the process. The, the vaccine studies that are happening now are, are, jump, are having to go through each of the, each of the gates uh, around proving safety, proving effectiveness. And so for vaccines that come through that process um, and succeed, we, we can be as sure as we, uh, we ever are about safety and effectiveness of, um, of what's developed. Okay, that's good to know. So this is something that's been brought up uh, quite a bit, I think, and it seems like there's still a lot of question about whether the virus will kind of dissipate over the summer months as it gets warmer and if we're, we should be concerned about it coming back when it gets colder again towards the fall and winter. Is there any evidence for that? Do we know what to expect in that arena? Yeah, we, we actually have had some um, additional evidence from, from new research come out on this in the last, uh, the last several uh, re weeks, particularly around how the, how, how the virus responds to certain environmental conditions. Um, we do know that um, the virus's survival um, in the environment is compromised by both heat and uh, heat, humidity, and ultraviolet light rays from, from, from sunshine. And so those are three things that are protective, uh, heat, humidity, uh, and UV sunlight. Um, and so uh, those are, uh, viruses typically don't have trouble, have, uh, you know, dealing with colder uh, environmental conditions, but um, um, so the heat, humidity, and, and sunlight will you know, definitely, definitely help. For, so for those of us in, in um, higher, uh, you know, higher elevations, uh, which typically we have a bit more UV exposure. Uh, and in the summertime, we, we have a lot of sunlight. Uh, those are going to be things that will, will help to contain the virus, you know, and limit its survival on surfaces, for example, outside. Sure, makes sense. So in that case, is it possible that, that we'll see a surge or, or an increase in cases when it gets colder again later in the year? That's a, a very real possibility. Um, again, other you know similar viruses do have that seasonality um, with it, um, and it um, there's still you know some uncertainty about exactly what generates that seasonal resurgence during fall and winter. Um, it may be related to cold weather. It's probably more likely to just our human patterns of social activity, and that we tend to spend more time indoors um, as the weather gets colder. And that, you know, that pre creates more opportunities for uh, viral transmission. So uh, but, uh, there is a reasonable expectation for, you know, a, again, a surge in transmission as we get into the uh, fall and winter months. Not positive, but, but a real possibility. Okay. Good to know. Um, you introduced us to the concept of contact tracing last time that we had you on, and that's been discussed a lot in subsequent stories. And it sounds like there's still some concern about using this process and really kind of having enough resources available to make sure that contact tracing happens and make sure that when there are people who've tested positive that, you know, everybody that they could have could have potentially come in contact with is uh, tested as well and kind of that whole process. So how has that progressed? Is it headed in the right direction? And what's needed to ramp up the process of contact tracing? 
Yeah, we are definitely in the process. Our public health systems around the country this, uh, are in the process of ramping up capacity for, for contact tracing. This is going to be an increasingly important strategy to use as we relax some of the blanket social distancing strategies as the stay-at-home orders start to be relaxed. Uh, we start to have more movement in communities. It's going to be increasingly important for us to identify new cases quickly and do the contact tracing to prevent those cases from blowing up into additional hotspots. Um, uh, uh, contact tracing is a fairly labor-intensive enterprise, and so uh, most of our state and local public health agencies around the country are now in the process of kind of ramping up their capacity, uh, looking at um, you know securing the staffing uh, of both you know trained um, public health uh, workers as well as using tapping into volunteer staffing where we can to build those uh, contact tracing um, systems uh, and then to also to ramp up the technology the data systems to to keep those systems um, uh, uh, working um, I know my in my home state of Colorado um, that that work of, of ramping up is is uh, progressing and happening at both state and local levels and that's the case in, in you know most other um, parts of the u.s and uh it's likely we're going to be trying to continue to build that capacity as we you know as we move you know further further into the year and as we start to um again uh reopen more more parts of the economy and, and society is there a role for technology to play in contact tracing? Is, is there, you know, use of smartphone data and things like that that can be leveraged to make that a more efficient process? Absolutely. There are a, a variety of um, uh, technologies that are um, uh, coming into the market being used. Uh, some that have been used successfully already in other countries that we're looking at adopting. You know, South Korea, for example, was a real leader in developing um, some of this um, you know, smartphone-based tech technology. We've had um, several of our, um, you know, IT um, companies in the U.S., Google, uh, Microsoft, and others to develop technologies that are uh, being used and tested. Uh, so if, I think we've got um, an expanding array of those kind of uh, tools um, to, to, to be used. Um, and uh, so we certainly will be, you know, learning about how best to apply those tools uh, um, over, over, the, um, over the weeks and months. Makes sense. That's interesting. Thank you. All right, Dave, you got some audience questions in the queue you want to get to? We do have a few. Thank you. Um, kind of coming in on uh, some questions about masks and also about uh, the easing of restrictions. So maybe we'll tackle some of the mask stuff first uh, real quick, Dr. Mays. Uh, you mentioned UV light earlier. Does direct sunlight help kill the virus off of masks? And what should we do as far as keeping our mask clean? Good question. Yeah, I think, you know, UV light will, will help to, um, you know, reduce virus vi vi viability on, on any, any surface. And so certainly uh, sunlight would help with masks. I think a better, you know, or is it probably a, an easier strategy is just to, um, is, is to wash your mask uh, uh, regularly. You're washing it with, you know, soap and water, um, is also uh, effective and doesn't, you know, you can do that on a cloudy day as well. Um. <laughs> um, let's talk about some of the questions that we're getting on easing the restrictions. Um, Joe had a good question, kind of rephrase, and then another one um, uh, about the, the reopening, Dr. Mays, and that the idea of the herd mentality of should we if some few people have are have gotten it, should we just get more people out and protect the vulnerable and the sick? Um, the idea of the herd mentality versus the slow opening. What's the difference there as as you guys see it? Yeah, the concept of herd immunity is an intriguing one. Um, uh, the problem is um, to really be protected through herd immunity. Uh, we have to get the disease prevalence up to probably 60%, at least 60%, 70% of the population. Um, that's that's going to take a really long time in most U.S. communities because in most communities, our best estimate is that we're down in the single di uh, single digits of prevalence. Colorado, maybe 1% to 3% of our population 
currently has the virus, we don't we don't want to wait that long to you know to be protected through purely purely herd immunity. And so uh, um, that's why you know all our models really are in agreement on this. A better strategy is to try to maintain social distancing as we even as we open up the economy and get back to work. Maintain social distancing as a way to prevent spread, uh, and that'll you know that'll get us farther out in time until we can start to bring online things like new treatments and and ultimately a vaccine. Um, uh, getting to herd immunity is likely to take a much longer time, and we'd have to we'd have to incur a much higher mortality rate to get there. What would that mortality or just follow up? Uh, what would that look like that mortality rate in your guys' math and uh, extrapolations? Yeah. Well, again, we, we still got a fair amount of uncertainty about the estimate of mortality um, uh, from this virus in the U.S., but still, you know, best estimates are, you know, it's, it's substantially higher mortality than other, other kinds of viruses. You know, we're talk, still talking about one, you know, in the 1% range. 1% um, in a, in a, country of 330 million people is a lot of people. Uh, we don't, we don't, we don't want to go there uh, if, if, if we can avoid it. Um, uh, some more questions about reopenings kind of in phases. Um, maybe you have some ideas on what it looks like. When do you think restaurants will be able to reopen um, for in-service dining? Kind of where does that fall in that? And then also what about lodging? When when the hotels and and that kind of in, that industry start opening up, yeah, I think for, you know for ultimately um, the the policy decision making authority is in the hands of our our governors as well as our local elected leaders and you know, cities and counties. Um, I think we're going to see a growing number of jurisdictions start to uh, open back up those kind of facilities. You know, in a, in a matter of weeks but with a strategy of, of trying to, um, to still maintain social distancing within, within restaurants, limiting capacity uh, of restaurants and other locations, uh, and using, again, strong hygiene practices in, in lodging in, a, in, in other areas. Uh, so I think we're gonna see more of that opening up um, over this next month, um, particularly for locations that are, um, have gotten a handle on the on the first wave of, of the virus. We're starting to see reductions in new cases, um, and for places where hospitalizations in particular have gone down, and so we're no longer so we've got more slack in the system and no longer concerned about overwhelming our, our hospitals. And so a growing number of jurisdictions are in that situation now, in, in, including in, in Colorado where where I live. Uh, and then a follow up on that one. Um, what about airline travel? What do you, what do you see, airline travel ever getting back off the ground? Uh, what kind of time frame, especially in a tight confines, until you have a vaccine? What does, what does the return of airline travel look like in a, in a timeline there? Yeah, well, I think that we're we're also going to have to figure out a way of getting that aspect of our um, economy and society back, you know, back working as well. Again, thinking about, um, and I know the airlines are working on these these strategies for in maintaining hygiene and social distancing within within an airline. So I think we're likely to see uh, more travel, but while maintaining more space between passengers. Um, for sure, you know, wearing masks, uh, both for employees as well as um, uh, as well as customers in those settings. Um, those are the kind of strategies I think we're, we're looking at for airlines in, in other forms of, of public transportation that we all depend on. Uh, a couple more uh, on the mass and then one on vaccine. And I, I think, well, we'll let you get back to your busy day, sir. Um, why do some people feel like they don't need to wear a face covering when they're out hiking? I don't know if that's a philosophical question you want to get into, but um, people are outdoor yeah. recreating. Should they still be wearing a mask, I guess? Or what's your opinion there? Yeah, I think it's still important um, uh, because, again, the, the mask is going to prevent your risk of transmitting uh, disease to, to others. Uh, and so even when we're outside on the trail, uh, we're going to likely be encountering other people. And so, um, uh, it, you know, it's it's still it's a it's an effective practice, and it's one that's in, it's it's really important to to, uh, uh, 
um, engage in. And it's it's not that hard to do to remember, you know, to bring bring a mask with you when you're on the trail or, um, or outside. Here's here's the last one on masks. Uh, Stephanie asks, uh, why does everyone say a mask is not protecting you? Isn't it in uh, isn't it somewhat? Yeah, um, the the best research sh sh suggests that it's it's generally not that protective for the person wearing it, and, and primarily because um, uh, viral particles, if they're in the air, uh, they can penetrate uh, the most you know mask material. Unless you've got the high powered mask like the N95 mask that we're they're, that we're preserving for healthcare workers, and so for most masks, it's not preventing viruses from getting to you, but it's, it's preventing these larger droplets that come out of your mouth or nose from getting out to other people. So it's really one, one directional protection. It's protecting the people that you're interacting with. All right, um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, on the vaccine front, uh, Dr. Mays, you said uh, it, on a best case scenario, probably 12 to 18 months on a vaccine. Um, what is the final element or the final piece that uh, makes officials say, okay, this vaccine is good to go? Yeah, ultimately it's a, it's a determination by our U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration and looking at the research, research from the, uh, that's been t tested on the vaccine, proving safety and then proving effectiveness that it actually, the vaccine actually generates the immune response that is protective, protective against the uh, uh, the, the disease. Once the FDA has reviewed those those re research results and agreed they're valid, uh, then you get the uh, FDA clearance to, to begin manufacturing and, and marketing. Very good. Well, Dr. Mays, uh, we can't thank you enough for uh, coming back for another edition of our live streams. Uh, I'm glad we uh, didn't have any uh, crazy technical issues like last time, but uh, we got through this one pretty well. Uh, so thank you again for your time today. Thank you for having me. Uh, just a quick reminder, we will have this video available for replay on all of our local news sites uh, web pages for you to watch and share along with the other uh, weekly live streams that we've done on personal finance, unemployment. Uh, we will be back next Thursday with another live stream and we are hoping to take a look at education and how the school year is finishing up and the challenges that our kids are having getting through this end of this school year. I am David Krause from the Aspen Times along with Kelly Geary Agnew with Swift Communications. We thank you for joining us for another live stream today. Stay safe and stay healthy.